All right, so we're on the fourth presentation of the day, and we've talked about the Temple family and Walter Temple's background, the, what was here before in terms of Rancho San Francisco, as well as the Sunny Slope Acres town that never really developed. And now we'll get into a little bit of the early history of Temple City as well. And the, the quote here uh, came from a newspaper article talking about this, why this town was started was a, a memorial to the Pioneer Temple family. When we think about the word pioneer, that can mean different things to different people. So if you're indigenous, for example, uh, that would be a different thing. But the idea here was to, to celebrate the family. As I talked about in the, the last presentation, there was about 285 acres that Walter Temple purchased from the Burkhardt Investment Company, which was planning this Sunny Slope Acres town that really never came to fruition. And uh, also mentioned the fact that this was not just the, the land, but also investing up to a million dollars to develop all this uh, pretty significant uh, amount of money for a relatively small community. So a Temple Townsite Company was established to be the developers of this. The names of the uh, directors included a woman named Dolores Bingham. She had one share of stock. She was the secretary, so she wasn't really involved on a deep financial level or managerial level. They just needed five people. And so that was a requirement. You had to have five directors. The other four, however, were all major investors. So uh, Walter Temple, obviously. Sylvester Dupuy, who I mentioned uh, briefly earlier, he was a sheep rancher in the Alhambra, El Sereno, uh, Lincoln Heights area, but uh, wound up building a very large Spanish colonial revival mansion on a hill at the edge of Alhambra that was known as the Pyrenees Castle uh, by some people, and more recently, more notorious because Phil Spector, the uh, record producer, wound up uh, having a homicide in that building and went to prison for that. He just died recently. So if people know that house, it's because of Phil Spector. Milton Kaufman was the manager of Walter Temple's properties and his oil projects. Kaufman was a, an Omani uh, merchant with his father, uh, among the few Jewish families out there, and had uh, dabbled in oil and real estate over the years too, including becoming a, a major developer of early Baldwin Park. George Woodruff was an attorney from the East Coast who came out to California, went to Stanford, wound up becoming involved in the, uh, the school for boys at Whittier, state school that has now been developed into a, a mall and housing, was city attorney at Whittier, and then became a private lawyer. So he was Walter Temple's attorney as well as a fellow investor. So those are the five people that were the founding figures of the Temple Townsite Company. The Historical Society has the original minute book uh, of the Townsite Company, which is really great. So that's where these pages uh, were drawn from, was what the Historical Society has. So again, the idea was to build this to memorialize the Temple family. The LA Times uh, also, as well as the Pasadena paper, referred to the uh, purchasing. You can see Burkhart misspelled uh, holdings bought for $500,000. So the other 500,000 was to do some development and they were planning to open on the 1st of July. All these people do this. They'll say, we're gonna open on X date and it's usually three, six, nine months or a year later that they finally wind up doing it. But uh, early advertisements, so again, the name Town of Temple was official, and they're commemorating the fact that there are already 40 houses that have been contracted to be built, that a certain amount of money of $350,000 invested, and that things are gonna start happening. Every community in this area called themselves the, the heart of the San Gabriel Valley, so that could be Temple, it could be Arcadia, could be whatever uh, in this location but you can at least get an idea from some of the advertisements of what they were trying to promote here. A lot of it is the proximity to downtown Los Angeles and the idea that when they get the streetcar line built out here, it'll be very convenient to, to get from one place to the other, even though people are driving their cars so much that the streetcars are already suffering from a lack of business. Great early photo. So uh, this, this is another typical little phrase you see, see it build. And so if you happen to be coming into the area, and you can see how rural and rustic this really was. Uh, lima beans, I think were being grown out here, uh, other crops. You're obviously looking north towards the San Gabriel Mountains. That would be, I'm assuming, Sunset Avenue, as it was called then, uh, Temple City Boulevard today. Oh, by the way, Marsh and Corrin were, Byron Marsh and, and Douglas Corrin were early exclusive agents, and we'll talk about them towards the end as things change with the, the development of the town. We happen to have in our collection uh, a copy of a brochure or a pamphlet that was issued for Temple City. Uh, the original is out in our booth today. And you can see a lot of the language that will be found pretty much in any of these types of booster publications. It's the ideal location. 
Every town would say that. Uh, we have great transportation. The surroundings are ideal. I had mentioned, by the way, in the last presentation that the idea of little farms was a big thing in the San Fernando Valley. So a, a place like Tarzana, for example, would, would be promoted that way. Uh, you could have your, your, your acre or up to five acres and raise enough on it to be able to either provide for yourself in terms of food for your table or maybe even make a little money on the side. And you see that first uh, sentence up there, the family seeking all that could be desirable as a place of residence naturally would select Temple City uh, as opposed to other ones. Showing you street scenes and, and uh, one of the buildings on the, on the principal corner of Las Tunas and Temple City Boulevard, as well as the next one showing you the, the, the completed depot for the Pacific Electric System. So City Hall sits right there, just a little to the south of us. And uh, again, when this was completed in 1924, the idea was that this would be a boost to the town and help it grow. It didn't really work out that way because again, people were not riding the streetcars like they had done before. Another early photo, uh, there are postcards that are printed of this showing one of those uh, early commercial buildings that uh, was still a pharmacy owned by you know different people over the years until not that long ago. Uh, the hardware store also pretty early on, but you just look not that far away, a couple hundred feet and you can see open land out there. So very definitely early days with the construction of the town. Another great shot. Uh, looking north on Temple City Boulevard, just below Las Tunas. So the shadow is another commercial building. I think all four of those still stand, just heavily uh, remodeled and remade. I have this map out uh, on the table today as well. This is from 1930, and it's, it's issued by Douglas Corrin, who was, again, one of those selling agents. So that's pretty much the original 285 acres. The town has grown, as most places have, but you can see where Garibaldi was on the north, Live Oak on the south, Encinita misspelled on the west and then Baldwin Avenue on the right, uh, but a little part, not part of the subdivision that, that wasn't purchased as part of the 285 acres. If you look in the center where Las Tunas Drive is, you can see the, the double track, uh, the Pacific Electric streetcar system. And then when it gets to the T where it says Tunas, it turns into the depot where City Hall is. And you can see Temple Park with a square in the middle, which I assume was the bandstand for what was there at that time. Temple Community Church was built just next to the park, basically where the library, east end of the library is, and a little bit to the north of that. Beautiful building, uh, Greek revival structure. Somebody came by uh, our booth earlier and said that the reason why this was torn down is because it got infiltrated with uh, rainwater or something and it got weakened and that's why it was knocked down. I assumed it was probably earthquakes and the need for you know uh, updating to earthquake codes and all of that. But you can see some of the nice detail in that structure as well. Uh, the image on the top left there is the first anniversary celebration. This was the end of September 1924. Had a, a big barbecue and rodeo and all of that. That was in the field just to the north of Las Tunas, east side of Temple City Boulevard. And uh, the newspaper articles talked about, you know, crowd being 1,000, 1,500 people. And they made a big point of saying they weren't going to sell any lots in town that day. They didn't want to make it seem like it was for commercial purposes. Obviously, they want people to come down, check it out, and if they can sell lots the next day, then that is just fine. Uh, on the bottom there, a great view of the city park. I was talking to somebody earlier about how many of those trees may still be growing, because there's quite a few trees in the park that are, uh, go back a ways, deodors and, and other kinds of trees. The flagpole, not there any longer. But you can see the bandstand just without the, without the roof on it. Just, there's a, a little fence there kind of in the center. And there's the community church in the background that I showed you a little bit earlier. And as a lot of towns did, the Temple or Town of Temple decided to promote itself at the Tournament of Roses Parade. So they did that for several years uh, during the 1920s. This is a, how a lot of the floats were in the early days, not the extravagant ones that we see today. They started off basically with uh, horse-drawn buggies uh, in, the, in the 1890s when they first got started. But by the 20s, you had automobiles like this. But this is pretty, pretty uh, typical and standard of what you would see with small towns. And again, there's the heart of the San Gabriel Valley uh, promotion for that. I'm not sure if this is the same float from the same year. It looks like they might be slightly different, uh, taller in the one on the top there. In terms of community life, some interesting things to note. Uh, R. Thornton Smith was a major figure in the early days of the town. He had been a photographer and had that interest years back uh, in other areas like Los Angeles. But once he got out here, he was a realtor, an insurance agent, but he took basically almost all of the original photographs that have survived of the community. So pretty important figure. Uh, you don't get a lot about women during these years. So I wanted to mention Mabel Walker Willebrandt. Her parents lived here in the town of Temple in the 1920s. I think she briefly resided here as well. 
And she wound up being the assistant United States Attorney General, which is a pretty big role. And her particular task in the 1920s was enforcing prohibition. So unfortunately for her, she had an impossible job, but she made the, the best she could of it. She worked in that, that position for most of the 1920s, a pretty prominent figure. It's just not a name people know today, but they probably should. And she had a Temple City connection. One of the things we have to remind ourselves, though, is that uh, almost anywhere in greater Los Angeles is going to have what were called restrictive covenants. But almost every place had the language you see here from this 1928 brochure. In other words, restrictions were placed on race and building so that Temple City can be the high, highly desirable place it is. Only white people reside here, white people of a desirable class. So I'm not sure what that last part means. Uh, no mobile homes, maybe? That's not really clear but they wanna make sure that uh, people take pride in their homes and the upbuilding of the community. Notice they say that building restrictions do not require the building of costly mansions. That I think is interesting because of what's happened in recent years. There's been a lot of redevelopment of property, new homes built on older lots, uh, that sort of thing. But they're strict enough to, provide, uh, to prevent the construction of unsightly homes. So no shacks, you just can't build anything in the community. They want people taking pride in their neighborhood. More great ads from these early years. Put your money in the town of Temple. If you invest here, it's gonna pay off. That in fact became a big thing. It's one thing to, to have lots sold for people to buy and build homes or businesses on. It's another thing people buy lots to purely speculate on. In other words, I buy a lot for 350, I'm hoping if I hold on to it for a year, it'll be $600 and then I can turn it over. Nothing gets built, nothing gets developed, it's just the speculation part of it. You can see on the right there, uh, big roomy home sites of $1,200, uh, half acre garden plots. So again, that's this promotion of the idea that you could have enough land to be able to have your chickens and, and your vegetable garden, what have you. You can see where the, where the prices are. Prices include paved and curbed streets, gas, water, and electricity. That's gonna refer to something fairly new that is going to be a problem in the town, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But there, there you see again, Marsh and, and Corrin, who are the kind of the major agents. There are others, so the Garvey Realty Company in Monterey Park, a guy in Pasadena, Thomas Berry in San Gabriel, they are also official agents as part of the development of this. There's your see it build, uh, one of the charming homes being built in the community, very similar in language, as I said before, to uh, a lot of other ads, not just here, but elsewhere. I like the home health and wealth awaits you if you come to the town of Temple as part of all this. And it's a delightful drive. So just coming out from Los Angeles and you know, 12 miles or so east and be able to see that. So if you follow the, the line on Huntington Boulevard, you get to Sunset or Baldwin Avenue, turn right and then head down to the community. Again, that promotion of the Pacific Electric and the adequate transportation, there's your advertisement for that opening barbecue I showed an image of a little bit earlier. The Pacific Electric sends their band out because it's part of their uh, promotion as well. We do have at the museum some of Walter Temple's Temple Town Site Company financial statements. So these kind of help us give a good idea of what's uh, transpiring. The Historical Society has the minute books for the meetings, and that's one part of it. And then we can kind of fill that in with the, the Temple Town Site Company side. What I was curious about in this one was on the cash dispersed, it shows at the, towards the bottom, Amy S. McPherson canceled. She was a very famous evangelist, Sister Amy, she was called. She started the Foursquare Gospel Church, which still exists. And uh, she, she would preach to thousands and thousands of people, had a radio program, an amazing and very controversial figure. I'm not sure what the $25 was for, why the Townsite Company was gonna disperse money to her and then cancel it. Who knows? Maybe she was thinking about buying some property out here. In any case, uh, it is fun to go through these uh, financial statements and see what's going on. These are more pages from the Historical Society's book. And some of the things you see in here are, are quite interesting in terms of who they're working with, uh, in terms of the agents, whether they're happy with what's going on. Some of these discussions are, are talking about making changes because they didn't feel that the promotion was happening quickly enough or not enough lots were being sold. There were also discussions about mortgages. So they had a contractor, for example, who was building houses but they also loaned him money. And that's not usually a business practice <laughs> you would be doing today. That can get you into a little bit of trouble. So these were a little bit looser operations than you would find being done now, and, but it was a different era and a different uh, location. They were really trying to also promote the development. At the same time, you have the streetcar system is about the highways because more and more people are turning to automobiles to get around. 
And so one of the bigger projects was the Arrow Highway concept. It was an idea that you'd have a, a straight as an Arrow Road from Los Angeles to San Bernardino. It did not get built that way. We have Arrow Highway segments. And even in Upland, there's an Arrow Route and an Arrow Highway because they couldn't figure out which one they were going to do. And we're, we're, that's what you have now. But that was one of the big things going on. Now, what is referred to in both of these articles is the Mattoon Act. This was a legislation passed by the, by the state uh, legislature that was uh, to basically provide for infrastructure for unincorporated communities. So if you were in Los Angeles or Pasadena, you had your own infrastructure that you would work on with that. You could do your own ordinances within your city. Out here, unincorporated, it comes basically on a bigger level. And so what the Mattoon Act was basically intended to do was to raise money for sidewalks, street lighting, other things, the development for a, a park possibly. Uh, it could be many different things. The problem with it was is that if a property owner could not pay their assessment for the Mattoon Act, the people on either side had to pay it. So imagine you guys live here, you live next door to each other, you can't pay your assessment, she's gotta pay for, for half of your assessment. Who's gonna to wanna to buy property in a community where you've got that condition? It was well intended, but it wound up becoming a real problem. Even Mattoon himself realized later on, oh wait a minute, I should have written this <laughs> differently. And so there, there's, uh, I don't know if I have it here, but you could find these uh, reports that would show how many lots were sold in the community. Basically of the roughly 1,200 they had, they got about 960 sold and it just dead stopped after that point. Like in one year they sold seven lots because we, people realized, wait a minute, I don't wanna go there because they have this weird thing uh, here. But the idea again was to develop highways and, and, and infrastructure that would benefit communities but it wound up being a problem on a very serious level. It got repealed, but by the time that happened, the damage had been done to lots of different places. So in, you see that reflected sometimes in the minute books of the meetings, but there are other things going on too, which I referred to in earlier talks here, which is Walter P. Temple's financial situation on a personal level is not improving. He was relying on oil wells at Montebello where he had first made his money. The wells were not producing as much over time. He went from tens of thousands of dollars a month to under 10,000, which sounds like still a lot of money, but the problem is he's got his own oil projects, he's in real estate in different areas like San Gabriel and Alhambra and Almani, not just here, and his income is dropping as his expenses are skyrocketing. Not to mention he's building a very palatial mansion for himself where our museum site is out in the city of industry. So he's getting into real trouble, and that's where he decides early in 1926 with his partners to take out bonds both for the Temple Estate Company, which handled all of his property outside of Temple City, and the Temple Townsite Company for here. So the page on the left is where the companies decided at the end of 1925, we're gonna do this. And on the right is an advertisement from the Los Angeles newspapers about, for investors, if you wanna get in, into the action here, here's what you need to know about the Temple Townsite Company and the bonds that are being offered. The good thing is you raise cash from this and then you can continue working. The downside, obviously, is you've got to pay off that principal and the interest uh, over time. And this is 1926. The peak of the real estate market was 1923. In Florida that year, they had a real estate crisis. And so there was a national problem going on with real estate in general. We have that happen, right? 2008 would be a good example of that. So the timing was not particularly good for all of this. Still, they tried to promote. This is the LA Times, uh, 1926. And uh, it says, buy an observer is the, uh, the, the byline for the author. So this leads me to think that they probably paid somebody to write an article and then put it into the papers because they're trying to promote the town. So there's the community church, the park, uh, a, a poultry ranch, a residence street. They're trying to show people this is where you want to live. Uh, but the thing is, they're ha increasingly having trouble with this. Uh, these are other ads from uh, Temple Townsite Towns Company. On the bottom is a kind of a cool one because it shows you a, a chicken coop fenced in area there where they're trying to promote this idea of having your own little agricultural area. Another problem came up though. In 1927, the United States Postal Service said, you've got to change the name of the town. The town of Temple sounds too close to Templeton, which is in San Luis Obispo County, Temple Street in Los Angeles, the Templeton School, which is actually called the Temple School in El Monte, the Angeles Temple, which is Sister Amy's church, and, and also Tempe, Arizona, they thought that was too close. And so the Chamber of Commerce decides we're gonna have a contest and open it up to anybody who submits names. 
And the judges included a guy named John Daggett, who was called Uncle John. He was a very famous disc jockey with KHJ Radio in Los Angeles, a Monrovia banker. John Stephen McGrory, the author of the Mission play, who was kind of a famous guy, was supposed to have been one of the judges, but he bowed out. And it was said he was absent from the county. He was a close friend of Walter Temple's. I've got a suspicion that Temple said, I don't want you judging this contest because they're changing the name of my town. Can you say you're going to be out of town? Whatever it was. And, and the article on the right says, the judges met in Los Angeles and quickly discovered they had undertaken a burdensome task as nearly every one of the names submitted was appropriate and all of that. So they actually delayed. And I think that's part of the tactic was, oh, this is really becoming difficult. We can't make a decision right now because Temple behind the scenes, he's not going to do this publicly, is protesting. He has a biographer, a guy he's hired to write the family history of the, the Temple family. And this gentleman's name was Perry Warden. And no one knows who he is now. He, the only thing he was really known for was he edited a book of a merchant in LA called, named Harris Newmark that was widely read at the time. Warden was a character he wrote in very strange ways. This is actually one of his more modified and moderate uh, letters. But he's writing to the editor of the Temple Times protesting about this idea of changing uh, the name of the town of Temple. And he even refers to the fact that the city council of LA was going to change the name of Temple Street. We can't have these things happen. Like, you can't change anything, right? And so uh, he tries his best. And it actually worked. What they did was they came up with a compromise, which simply was, well, we'll just call this Temple City, which still sounds to me like Templeton <laughs> and other things, but I guess the Postal Service was okay with it, and that's what it wound up becoming in 1928. The official name was as of October 1st, 1928, so all this controversy uh, finally went away. But there were other bigger problems, which was the continuing lack of sales. Davis Baker was a major real estate company in Pasadena. Uh, they did a lot of successful subdivisions. And so they were brought in by the Temple Townsite Company to handle this. This is early 1928, and they were hoping that it would turn things around and make it better. And as much as Davis Baker advertised, uh, it did not succeed. The real estate market was, was bad, the Batoon Act was still in place, and so there were a lot of uh, uh, problems. This is the Temple Townsite Company's statement of assets and liabilities in the spring of 1927. And so even though the assets on the bottom right of the second page show just over a million dollars and the liabilities are half of that, so it looks like the net worth isn't really that bad, sometimes you can paper over things in these financial statements. It's been known to happen. And so the, 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 the bottom line is there's just too much debt that's been generated. And uh, it's also you know, a little concerning when you see things like Supreme Court case pending on the right side there. Uh, you've got your notes payable, uh, and uh, are those a, a particularly high uh, amounts? At the bottom of the left side, you've got your trust assets. That's where you're dealing with these bonds, and you've got first mortgages of $330,000. That's not an insignificant amount of money uh, for a project of this size. George Woodruff, who is not just an investor in this process, he is also uh, the lawyer for Walter Temple, is writing him increasingly of his concerns about what's going on. This is just one of several letters that he wrote about, look, we've got some issues we've got to deal with. You've got your oil property, which is still the most valuable thing. You've got the Workman Homestead Ranch, where, where Temple has, has just finished his 12,000 square foot mansion out there. And uh, we've got the Temple Townsite Company and Temple Estate Company, and we've got to figure out what we're going to do to, to straighten things out. And unfortunately, nothing that Woodruff came up with was going to work because there were people who weren't going to loan money anymore. You can go to the bank only so often. You can go to private investors only so often. And uh, the well is going to start running dry, especially when the Great Depression breaks out at the end of 1929. And in fact, the left side there is a director's meeting on October 29th, 1929. That was the exact day the stock market crashed in New York City and that ushered in what was going to be the worst economic uh, panic that we had ever seen in this country. And so what they're talking about there is getting a loan of $2,700. That's nothing. I don't know what that's going to pay for, but that's how desperate they are. They're just trying to get whatever funding they can to keep things going as long as possible. On the right is their meeting from April 15, 1931, when the Great Depression is really bad. And it says on the resolutions there, whereas the financial conditions of the Temple Townsite Company are such that it is unable to meet 
It's immediate tax and interest obligations. Never mind anything else you got to pay for. Just the taxes and interest. They can't do it. And monies have been advanced to other people of $100,000, know, $100, and that's another encumbrance. We have to sell property. So it just gives you an idea of where things were. Now, that was 1931, but the end actually came a little bit earlier. This is the Temple Times, which I found at the county library right next door here uh, some years ago, where the Temple Townsite Company decides it's going to sell. And it's going to sell to Douglas Corrin, who was one of those exclusive agents. And it's May of 1930. That's also how the, the war memorial that's here in the park got moved here from Montebello because Temple was losing everything and he wanted to preserve that. So he had that monument brought up here from his oil property so it could be preserved. And so this is a May 1930 photograph. Things look pretty beautiful. The, got the snow up in the mountains and all that, but Temple is basically wiped out. Uh, within two years, he loses the last property he could hold on to, which is his ranch out in the, where, where our museum is today. That was lost in 1932. He had moved to Ensenada in Baja, California to try and save money. How many Americans live down there now, right? He's maybe kind of an early example of that. Uh, in fact, he uh, was in Ensenada, and his mail was uh, addressed in care of John Husong. So if you heard of Husong's Cantina, which is a famous hangout there, he would go down the street to get his mail at Husong's Cantina. Who knows what else he did there? And then we'll go back home. But even that didn't work. He moved to Tijuana briefly, then he went to San Diego. He got diagnosed with cancer. He wound up living in a small little house behind the home his girlfriend's parents lived in in Lincoln Heights, uh, part of Los Angeles. So when he died in 1938, it was a very different situation than he had been in just 20 years before that. That's the thing about speculation. When you're in things that are risky, that's what can happen to you. And that's what often takes place during these up and down cycles of our economy. But the thing is, he did leave a community behind that was well planned, well laid out, had some good ideas in terms of the park and, and the streets and the streetcar and all of that. So hopefully his legacy will continue to be that he set the table for what Temple City became later on. So I thank you guys for coming out and, and uh, hanging out with us and hearing some of this history. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.